Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar meeting hosted by the Nordic Bioplastics Organization. Um, I'm Bo Valtig, and I'm a member of the board of Nordic Bioplastics and also the editor of the packaging magazine Nord Emballage. And I'm also one of the founders of this organization. The Nordic Bioplastics Organization today has uh, 63 member companies, and uh, we have been on the market for 10 years now. We were founded in 2012. Um, this is going to be a slightly shorter seminar that we are used to. We have three, three speakers today, uh, nevertheless, very good speakers, very good presentations. And for those of you who are members, we will have the, the annual meeting right after this. And uh, in, the, in the future, we hope we can have the annual meeting and seminars more live, so to say. But uh, today we choose to do it this way. Uh, we are going to have, as I said, three speakers, and um, they will speak for around 10, 15 minutes each. And then there will be time for questions, and you can send in questions on the chat. No problem with that. And we will put them to the speakers um, uh, as many as we can, uh, depending on how much time we have left. We have to finish just before 11 o'clock today. Um, uh, we will record this and it will be published later on on the, our website. And there you will also find the presentations uh, in a PDF format from, from the speakers. So I think uh, we better start directly since we, have short, we are short of time. So uh, the first speaker will be Mr. Edvard Hall from, uh, Edvard Hall from, from uh, Bio Extracts. And he will talk about PH, PHA, the sleeping giant of bioplastics. And uh, if it's true, as he says, that uh, it, this is a material that can replace 70% of all fossil-based plastics, then we, he is absolutely right. So. Edward, please, uh, the, the screen is yours, not the stage. The screen is yours. Welcome. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Busse, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. I assume uh, that my screen is uh, visible for everyone. Otherwise, please let me know. Um, as you mentioned, I, I'm going to present on the topic of PHAs, uh, the sleeping giant of bioplastics, uh, PHA, that's an abbreviation for polyhydroxyalkanoate, uh, and this is a group of uh, bio-based and biodegradable polymers. Um, and what I'm going to do today is that I'm going to give a, a, a very high-level overview of this uh, fairly new and very exciting uh, material. I'm going to assume that the listener or viewer doesn't know anything really about um, uh, PHA. So, so if you're an expert, then, uh, then you, know, you can go and make some uh, coffee already because then you will hear nothing new. Although I, I will end the presentation with uh, a few updates about future or both existing and future production capacities uh, which are uh, planned globally for PHAs and that that is will likely be new information for everyone I think um, I, I as you can tell from the, the title of my presentation I am uh, fairly optimistic about uh, the potential of uh, PHA uh, but I should make the disclaimer that I am not a objective observer, uh, as I am the CEO of uh, a company called Bioextracts, based in in Lund in Sweden, um, and we develop technologies for the production of uh, uh, PHAs. So, so I do have a vested interest in the future of PHAs. So um, I'm not going to spend time talking about the need for uh, PHAs. I think that everyone or most people uh, on this call agree, uh, first of all, that we do need to develop alternatives, sustainable alternatives to conventional plastics, considering the, the issues that, that uh, they come with both uh, with regard to environmental degradation, so plastic um, plastic in the environment, but also to CO2 emissions. And I also think that most here agree that while we have sustainability, sustainability issues around plastics, they also serve a very important purpose 
in society. Um, but instead, I'm going to focus on uh, the solution that I believe PHAs are. Uh, and to give you a very quick uh very high level introduction. Uh, it's important to start by mentioning that it's a group of polymers. So PHAs is not one specific polymer, it's a group of polymers. And the variety of monomeric compositions in these polymers is almost indefinite. Um, around five or six are being commercially produced uh, today. And as Busse said in the introduction, uh, a very important aspect of PHAs is that thanks to this very wide variety of different material properties that you can reach, you can also replace the vast majority of the conventional plastics that are currently on the market. And PHAs are produced by uh, bacteria. Uh, what the picture you see here uh, is of bacteria that are filled uh, with PHAs. And this so-called accumulation phase is the first phase of the PHA production process, which consists of, of two steps. First of all, you grow bacteria and you force them to start accumulating uh, PHAs. Uh, and after this step, it looks something like the, the picture here you can see on the slide. And then after that, you need a method to extract the PHAs from the PHA producing bacteria. I'm gonna talk a bit more about the, this production process um, uh, later in this presentation. Um, when you talk about polymers in general from a sustainability perspective, you often look at two aspects. Uh, one is whether or not or to which extent it is bio-based. So uh, to which extent, uh, extent have you used um, non-renewable resources or fossil-based resources to produce the material. And the second kind of spectrum that you look at is whether or not it's biodegradable. And there is a kind of scientific or technical definition of biodegradability, which is that the material can be converted into biomass, CO2, and water by microbes. Uh, in practice, uh, the, the, you, you often need to have a bit more nuance in the sense that certain materials can be biodegradable at, for instance, very high temperatures, a PLA, PLA which I show here in the Northwest um, Square is an example of that. It is kind of by definition biodegradable, uh, but you, uh, you, you need very high temperatures in order to achieve this biodegradability. And there are a lot of materials that are, for instance, uh, biodegradable, but not bio-based. Caprolactone is an example of that, that biodegrades very quickly in nature, but it's not completely bio-based. And then there are materials like PLA, for instance, which is bio-based or can be bio-based, but it's not biodegradable from a kind of practical perspective. Now, there are a lot of materials that are both bio-based and biodegradable. Um, a leaf from a tree or a leaf from a tree is an example of a bio-based and biodegradable material. A stick is also bio-based and biodegradable, and so is a, a piece of uh, grass or a grass straw. What makes PHAs interesting is that it can be tailor-made to replace most conventional plastic. So it can be given characteristics when it comes to everything from melting temperature to barrier properties, tensile strength, and etc., very similar to most of the kind of most used uh, conventional plastic like polypropylene, polyurethane, PET, and PE. And that is really the unique feature of uh, PHAs. And if there is something you should take with you from this presentation, uh, that is that PHAs are bio-based biodegradable, and it has characteristics which are very close to conventional plastics. Now, PHAs are produced um, in a few different steps. I, I mentioned it before that there is a accumulation phase and there is an extraction phase. Um, but I would like to take a, a step back uh, and talk a bit about the raw material that you can use. Well, basically, you can use any kind of carbon rich material or any kind of organic material. This ranges all the way from uh, raw materials like palm oil and, 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 and for that matter petroleum, but of course that is something that we want to avoid. Instead, most of the industry is focusing either on 
uh, first generation um, sugars uh, or uh, organic materials like like sucrose, uh, for instance. Uh, but we're also uh, working quite a lot with different kinds of waste streams or, or, or byproducts. One example is used cooking oil, which is used by a lot of companies to produce uh, PHAs. Um, but there are also a lot of companies working with uh, kind of real dirty waste streams like municipal wastewater, so toilet uh, water. There was a, a um, uh, not, not article, but a uh, story about a KTH uh, researcher producing PHAs from municipal wastewater on SVT, the Swedish national TV, a few days ago. Uh, but that is by no means kind of on the forefront. There are a lot of companies doing this in pilot scale uh, around the world. Uh, so basically, you can use any kind of organic material or carbon-rich material. You can also use different kinds of gases. There is an American company who wants to produce PHA from carbon capture. Um, so using this carbon-rich material, you grow bacteria, and then you, you steer the process uh, in a way that kind of forces the bacteria to start accumulating the carbon in the environment inside the, their cells. So they, they do this as a form of energy and carbon storage for the future, kind of from a conceptual perspective, not unsimilar to how humans store fat. Uh, because the bacteria, they do it because uh, at, at that point of time, there is a deficit of certain nutrients in the environment, in particular nitrogen. So then they can't grow and then instead they start to accumulate or synthesize and then accumulate the carbon inside the bacteria cells. Uh, I'm not going to do this as, as a kind of PR exercise for bioextracts, but I do want to mention that we have a, a patent pending technology to do this, uh, this specific step. Um, and then after this, uh, this uh, accumulation phase, you need to extract uh, the PHA from the bacteria but for, because you can obviously not use the granules directly when they're inside the bacteria cells. What most companies do here is that they use different kinds of chemicals to break down the, the cell walls of the PHA uh, producing bacteria. Again, I'm not going to go into kind of uh, details about bioextracts and our technology, but this is the core of our company. We have developed a bio-based method to do this extraction, uh, which improves this kind of sustainability profile of the material. And it also uh, lowers the cost very radically. And out on the other side, you get two products. You get kind of the, the PHA granules, uh, which can be used uh, to, uh, to compound different types of uh, uh, materials, which can be uh, forwarded to uh, converters. You can also use them directly into different kinds of formulations, for instance. And then unique for our specific process is that um, is that we get a co-product, which is the hydrolyzed cell walls of the PHA producing bacteria. And these cell walls contain approximately 15% or sorry, 50, 50 percent protein. So that can be used as a protein ingredient in to feed and so on. And that's pretty cool that you can take uh, municipal wastewater, so toilet water, and you can turn it into a bio-based and biodegradable plastic and get something that can be fed to animals as a code product. It can also be fed to humans. I, I eat it uh, once in a while uh, in the lab, uh, but but don't tell the, um, what you call it, lift smells back. I'm not sure about what, what that's called in English. Um, so despite these uh, kind of very nice characteristics of PHAs, the current production is still very small. Um, you can see here that it's, 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 it's a sliver of the total production capacity of bio-based uh, or biopolymers uh, in general. Um, but the, the future is, in my view, uh, in the hands of uh, PHAs. The European Bioplastic Association mean or says that PHAs is the, the most promising bioplastic out there and that is because of it versus its versatile uh, 
versatile um, uh, characteristics in combined with this very nice sustainability profile. And this is also reflected in the planned production capacities of PHAs globally. Currently around 42,000 tons of PHAs are produced every year. That is, of course, a very, very low number that doesn't even show kind of uh, uh, compared to the total plastic production globally. But a, if we only look at the, the, the public um, production increases that has been announced by different PHAs uh, producers, uh, we see a 20-fold increase in the production capacity over the coming four years. Uh, so it has a, has a very interesting uh, future. Uh, I would say this is, also, this is also confirmed by a lot of different reports. Uh, there's, for instance, one indicating that the total production capacity in 2027 will be around 1.5 million tons. And we also see that a lot of venture capital and other kind of capital is going towards PHAs. Um, and with that, I'm done with my small uh, advert for uh, PHAs, and I welcome any questions, although I'm not sure if the Q&A session is now or if it's after all three presentations are done. But either way, thanks a lot for, for taking the time to listen to me. Okay, thank you, Edvard. Yeah, I think we can take some questions right now, actually. We have some in the chat here, and uh, uh, let's see if I start it here. Um, bum, bum, bum. Uh, can you can you mix PHA with fiber to WPC? I'm not sure what WPC stands for. Maybe I'm I should know that, but I, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and neither do I. So it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. We, we have mixed. Uh, so for instance, we're in one project together with the uh, Boros Textile School uh, and also H&M uh, to, to try to replace polyurethane foams with a combination of PHAs and fibers. Um, and and yeah, we have seen some promising results from, from doing these kind of... Uh, mixes but I, i'm not you know I, I can't answer that specific question because i don't know what what uh, they are after no i don't know either um another question uh, do pha comply with en 13432 composting norm um so uh, I, and i'm writing i don't know if you can see it but i'm writing my email address now in the presentation uh, so if anyone has any specific question that you don't want to ask publicly, you're welcome to email me on this address. Um, so as, as, as I did mention, PHAs uh, are a group of polymers, and these different certifications uh, are, are, uh, are given on not on a kind of molecule by molecule basis, but rather on a kind of material by material basis, so the material that goes into a certain product. And most of the times you tend to, you tend to uh, compound PHAs with another kind of, uh, of polymer, for instance, or fiber for that matter. Um, but in general, um, that there is uh, quite a lot of data about the degradability, compostability, both in, on marine and, and on land. Uh, settings and it performs very well. There is quite a lot of grades of PHAs that has different kinds of uh, uh, compostability certifications, uh, as mentioned, both in on land and in sea. Uh, this specific one, I don't know if there are any PHA grades that has that. We are, we are. I should mention that our focus is to develop technologies for the production. We are not producers ourselves at the moment and these kind of questions is also is tend to be things that our customers uh, are, are dealing with okay um, in which conditions is pha deg degradable in home composting yeah so i think i answered that uh, that uh, in, in the last uh, answer but yes both right. both in on both in home composting and and in nature and in marine environment so you don't need industrial compost. Okay. 
Is PHA a natural polymer according to the EU definition? Uh, for a, some weird reason, no, because they don't consider fermentation to be a natural process. This is, of course, uh, uh, insane to use a, a, a strong term, but uh, that's the EU's current position, at least. So it is, it, it's not an accepted uh, material to use according to the single use directive, because I guess that's the question uh, that, that uh, you know, or the answer okay. that you're looking okay. for. I see. We also got the explanation for the VPC here. It's wood plastic composites. Yeah, so I have no idea. It would be my answer then. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. you know, is the PHA recyclable? It says here. Yes, it is. It, it's, it can be recycled uh, in, in two ways. It can be recycled as kind of a classic recycling system. So it can be melted and uh, reused. Uh, but you can also use PHA as a uh, raw material to produce new PHA. So you can grow bacteria on PHAs uh, and, and thereby produce virgin PHAs based on old PHAs. But there, there will, of course, be a loss uh, in the mass balance because some will be conferred, converted into biomass and CO2 and heat as well. Okay. Uh... Is PHA uh, food contact safe material? Again, this, this is the, these kind of food contact is similar to compostable. These certifications are given on not on a kind of molecule by molecule basis, but yes, there are PHAs that are food contact approved. And how long is the process time from start to making granulate? Um, so with the, the, the quickest process is to make a medium chain length PHA. This is a, a very low melt temperature type of PHA. That takes approximately 50 hours, five zero hours from raw material to, to dry granule. Okay. Uh, and then a more technical question. When turning PHA, longer chain length uh, slash higher... MV to resemble traditional polymer properties, PP, etc. Doesn't this decrease the biodegradability? Yes, in general, when, when you increase the chain length of PHAs, you, you get a decrease in, in uh, biodegradability. Uh, it take, or rather, it, it's as biodegradable, but it takes longer. Uh, still, and, and if somebody's interesting, you, you interest, you can email me and I can send, send quite a lot of data about the biodegradability of both short and medium chain length PHAs. There are no real long chain length PHAs uh, available. And I don't, I think those are very difficult to produce. And uh, is the, it's uh, the processing similar to fossil bias plastics like polypropylene? Uh, the processing, um, yeah. So this is what what the PHA industry has been been working on during the last twenty years. So there, there are kind of two two issues that that the PHA industry has faced. One is the price that has come come down significantly, and the other one is the processability, in particular the the low or the, the closeness of the degradation temperature of, and the melting temperature of PHAs. But this has been solved by using different kinds of, uh, I'm sorry, I should also say that crystallization behavior has been a, a challenge. Um, but th there's been quite a lot of work done on this and has si significantly improved. And I would say that today, uh, there, there, there are methods to make PHAs as processable as, for instance, polypropylene. Uh, okay, uh, I think we can take the last question, then we have to go to the next speaker. Uh, let's see here. PHA usually show a very tricky crystallization behavior. Is there any possibility to influence that already during the production fermentation process? Um, so what, what we have... Well, the, the answer, the short answer is no. Uh, you can't really, really, um, or as far as we know, you can't really affect the crystallization behavior through the fermentation process. But what we have managed to do lately, and I'm happy to discuss this with anyone who wants to talk about it, 
uh, we have we have managed to to change the crystallization behavior and improve the crystallization behavior very significant significantly by combining two types of PHAs, where one of the types of PHAs acts uh, like a crystallization agent in the other, and we got some very interesting data on this, and I'm, I would be happy to share that with uh, with anyone. Okay, Edward, I think there is uh, some more questions actually, but we don't have time for that. But you, you will get them and you will, I hope you can answer the questions directly to, 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 the, to the people who asked the question here. So um, I, I say thank you very much for this presentation. It was very interesting. And uh, we're looking forward to see how the material will develop in the future, actually. Uh, we are going over to the next speaker. Uh, and the next speaker is uh, placed in Ljungby in Småland at the company Embalator. And his name is Mats Jepson. And Mats is also, by the way, a board member of, of the Nordic Bioplastics organization, organization. And he's going to talk a little bit about the new material they offer now, and that's BioPP. It came to the market quite newly. And if you uh, is not uh, satisfied with all the information that Matt gives you here, you can read more about it in Northern Valage, one of the latest issues. So Matt, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Buse, for this. And uh, I will try to be as precise as possible. We are a converter, so we are not the material specialists. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Jepson. I'm innovation manager at Embalator Innovation Center. Uh, so I will start with some slides and, and some information about Embalator for, for you who don't uh, know us so well. So I will make, there we have it. Uh, Embalator is a part of Herenko Group, a family owned company in fourth generation with long traditions, uh, a wide product range, innovation driven and relationship builder. We are, as I said, a converter and uh, of rigid packaging solutions. And once again, not the material supplier. Uh, I will turn over a bit more than 200 million euro. Uh, and the big part of Embalato is metal packaging, which is one of the business area. But uh, my team at the Innovation Center, we focus on the plastic based packaging. And this meaning uh, pails and containers in plastic produced in the uh, UK, and in Sweden, Jungby, where I'm situated, and in Vitwe. Uh, our tubes are produced in Åstorp, Skåne, and in uh, Jo. Uh, we then have both injection molded and extruded tubes. Uh, our caps and closures are produced in our highly automized factory in Växjö. And finally, we also produce bottles and canisters, and this we do in Mellerud. Uh, at the Innovation Center, we focus our material trials based on this Real products, prototypes, smaller sizes than our factories. Uh, the Innovation Center, to speed up uh, Embalato sustainable work, we started up this in 2020, investing more than 20 million sec. We have during the last 12 months been ramping up with uh, 760 square meters extra facilities, new equipment, staff and also ramping up the speed of our trials. In the team, we are now four people. Besides me, it's a process specialist, a material specialist, and an innovative designer. Uh, the challenge we have is, is uh, really to launch new sustainable packaging with the lowest possible environmental impact. Uh, we also reduce waste by focusing on materials and technologies that will provide better barriers to both food and chemistry content. Uh, we try new materials to help with lightweighting. We also look at new processes and methods where plastic is not the holy material. It could also be other fiber-based materials and processes. Uh, we work with training and environmental modeling as well as tests of both our own products, but also products we find in the market. We perform thermal analysis using DSE, TDA, TMA, FTIR, OTR, and GCMS, to mention some of it. And we are happy to help our current and future customers with different trials in their new product developments. Embalato products are an important part of your life. When redesigning your home, gardening work, taking care of your skin, relieve constipation, 
or just enjoying your barbecue. Envolato started early with bio-based products already in 2008. And since 2012, we offer products with renewable raw material, sugarcane based for bottles, cans, tubes, and closures. In 2016, our factory in UK began to offer recycled material in its pails with 25 to 100% post-consumer recycled content. And in 2020, we began to do the same in our Swedish plant in Ljungby. From 2021, we have ensured that all our factories in Sweden has green power to 100%. We have started using post-consumer recycled aluminium in our tubes. Plastic reduction, giving the lowest weight of a plastic cold source container in the stores in Sweden. This is with 100% mono material and easy to mechanical recycle and sort in the standard streams. 2021, we also launched this BioPP product containing at least 30% BioPP in the actual pail. Also, this product is 100% mono material and easy to mechanical recycling in existing systems like in Motala. Our BioPP product is just one of many possibilities we see to reduce our dependency of fossil based materials. At the Innovation Center, trials are made with sugar based material water-soluble materials, corn-based, algae-based, bacteria fermentations, like the PHA, Edward mentioned, starch-based, coffee grounds, lignin, or other fiber-based materials. Just to be clear, since we find existing biodegradable materials having too long degradation time for our rigid products, and also, as Edward said, uh, high temperatures are normally needed. We rather than talk about bio-based products, and at least as today, not as the solution for pollution. If there is a use of a product that for certain will go for incineration, then use one of our possibilities to the right side. But Embalato's main focus is on mechanical recyclable bio-based streams, as we see on the left side, as the drop in plastics, bio-PE and bio-PP. With the very high carbon emissions during incineration, incineration should definitely be avoided for these products. Since they are fully recyclable, make sure they are placed in the plastic recycling bin. That is the solution for pollution. A bio-based recyclable packaging is the way forward to reduce carbon footprint and help climate change. We consider us as pioneers of BioPE. Ten years ago, being the first in Europe with tubes from renewable sources, and probably we were the first in the world. Also the same year, we were launching sport bottles. Fast growing sugar canes has really high biogenic carbon uptake. And now we consider us pioneers with this bio PP. In close partnership with Borealis, the top two among polyolefin producers in Europe, and Balator expanded the sustainable portfolio in October last year with the physical content bio PP. So what is this product? Borealis can partly segregate biopropane by controlled blending and obtain physical content with at least 30%. The feedstock comes from second generation of renewable feedstock, not suitable for consumption. It's non-food crops and waste residues from vegetable oil, refining or used cooking oil, as also Edward mentioned for his products. With C14 isotope analysis, an actual biocontent proof of your exact packaging can be taken. So what's the value with this product? It's make it possible to claim the actual biocontent of a product and get the proof of it. With this kind of proof, it's also possible with an OK bio-based certification, if that is what is wanted from your customers. Also, you avoid the struggling with explaining mass balance concept to customers and the ISCC plus certification and the cost for audits and administration and so on. For the Embalator BioPP products, no ISCC certification is needed. Do you get the difference? For those of you who are new with mass balance and ISCC and the C14 method, this is my way of explaining it. The ISCC plus and the mass balance is a chain of custody model designed to keep track of the total amount of input renewable feedstock 
throughout the production cycle and ensure the same amount output to finished goods. You certify the process. The physical content of renewable feedstock can be proved with C14 isotope analysis for determination of the biocontent in the actual finished product that you have in your hand. Then you certify and get the proof of the product, not the process. I hope this explains it. Uh, the ISCC plus for mass balance is like the power and electricity, green electricity. So if you're interested, just contact sales at Embalator uh, to get different kinds of products containing at least 30% bio-based polypropylene. We can offer pails, containers, caps, and closures in this material. For higher bio-based content, we offer the mass balance solution with ISCC certification. Thanks for listening, and uh, please follow us on LinkedIn. Thank you, Max. Thank you much. Um, I can't see that we have any special questions so far uh, here. Um, but uh, one question for me, of course, is uh, how, how, how do you find the interest on the market for this bio PP? Well, it, it's, it's always a struggle with the cost uh, levels. Of course, bio based products have a higher cost, and, and uh, I think that it's our main. Uh, uh, issue to be able in the future to 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 get rid of of the fossil based to to get the price uh, at a better level or the awareness that it's really needed to to pay some extra. Yes. So well, what you actually say is that many companies want to be sustainable as long as it doesn't cost anything. You said it. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I know. I know that's the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but of course, I, I think the, we, we have a quite uh, good interest from many brand owners, uh, but, but uh, not so many launches yet. Uh, let's see, here are some questions coming up. Um, why is it necessary to certify for ISCC Plus if it's more than 30% bio PP? Yeah, because then, uh, then you can't use this uh, segregated uh, product, the bio PP. Then you need to have uh, the more mass balance approach if you want higher, higher percentage. If you would like a hundred percent product, then then you need to have the ISAC plus certification and mass balance. Mm -hmm. This is maybe what we are talking about, and I'm not sure you can say what's the premium for bio based PP versus conventional fossil based PP. I suppose they mean the, pr the price. Uh, I guess. The, yeah, that you are welcome to, to contact me or anyone else at the Embalator and then uh, we can discuss that. Could, could you indicate how high the green premium is for the 30%? Uh, as I said, they rather contact us directly because it depends on for what product and so on. So uh, we take it case by case. Mm -hmm. And then we, I think you answered that. Why choosing the 30% limit in bio-based PP? That was about the mass balance, wasn't it? Or? Uh, the 30% thir choose that is then you can actually get the proof that what you have in your hand is based on renewable feedstock uh, using uh, the mass balance and the ISEC plus certifications. And you, you know that the input somewhere and, and there is uh, a content in some products on the market, but it doesn't really need to be the one you have in your hand. I have a question, another question. What about the availability of BioPP? I mean, uh, you're producing products in great volumes. Is, is there a sort of unlimited uh, availability of, of BioPP? If, if I come as a customer, do I, or do, I, do I have to be afraid that you will not be able to support? Not, uh, it, it's uh, yeah, today with all materials, you, you, you can't promise anything, but, but of course with, with a very low, uh, bio-based renewable uh, materials on the market of course it's not unlimited but but uh, right, right now it, it, it's still uh, a good possibility to have uh, bio-based uh, materials either the bio the 30 percent bio pp or iscc plus but of course it, it's need to to be focused and and increase this part definitely but but if there is no 
demands and input on the market, then, then the production will not increase either. If only 30% is bio-based PP, is the rest then fossil-based? Yes. Yes. Okay, I think there are some more questions, but you can answer them uh, by yourself later on, Mats. Yeah, I we will send that. it to you. We will send it to you, and you can you can see them. I think we we, we have to say thank you to you and and uh, go over to our last speaker. Thank you. Uh, and uh, for those of you who was expecting or just uh, turned up to to listen to Tina Dominen, I must make you disappointed because Tina couldn't make it today and. Um, so she sent uh, a replacement, and that's uh, Tommy Nyman, who is CCO at the company Woodley in Finland. And uh, Woodley uh, produce uh, a sort of wood-based uh, plastic, actually. And they have come to the market with an interesting film newly, where they are packing sandwiches, for example. Uh, so I think, uh, Tony, Tommy, it will be very interesting to listen to you, and I give you the screen from now. Welcome. Very good. Thank you very much. And... Uh... As, as Paul mentioned, apologies for Tina not being able to join. You have to bear with me today. Um, I will show you a presentation on Woodley, probably some product examples as well, and feel free to ask any questions as we go. So Woodley uh, was started in 2011 as, as a startup by, by a seed company. And uh, the idea was initially to produce a plastic out of wood. And uh, it took a while to get there. In 2017, we made our first uh, product demos um, in terms of film. And uh, a few years ago, we managed to, to launch the first commercial products. It's a new, uh, new type of wood-based plastic material, meaning that for the first time ever, we can produce a thermoplastic material that can be converted with practically all conventional techniques and, and we can replace uh, practically 94% of the uh, plastics that are uh, on, on the market today in terms of their market share. It's suitable for packaging, that is um, our key market at the moment, but we are also working on products and, and they will be launched by our uh, customers and converters soon. We have uh, a major major issue in the world with the plastics um, uh, waste that needs to be solved. And, uh, and there are solutions uh, for that to be solved. We can recycle them, we can turn them bio-based. And, and uh, our aim is to become a solution rather than uh, being part of the problem. What we see is that uh, we are in the need of easily recyclable uh, bio-based plastics. And our solution is, is really hitting on that angle. Uh, now, in, in Europe only, the, the amount of plastic waste is uh, roughly 25 million tons. And uh, out of that, a big part comes from packaging. Now, uh, we know that bottles, for example, in, in various countries, in the Nordics, in Germany, etc., have deposit schemes and are well, well recycled, but, but still more recycling needs to happen. One of the key, key reasons why plastics are not being recycled properly is because of the extreme diversity. And what we bring to that market is, is plastic that suits um, almost, almost all applications, basically. We hope to uh, produce more grades in the future. I'm, I'm, I will explain those further in, in the presentation. Now, the European Union is doing a lot of work in, in the direction of uh, solving the plastics issue in terms of the EU Green Deal, uh, supporting bio-based materials, the Circular Economy Action Pact Plan, the Plastic Strategy, single-use plastics directive, even though there are flaws in, flaws in these that are, uh, are a struggle for new materials such as ours. And of course, the uh, waste directive uh, revision. Now, the single-use plastics directive is, is an interesting thing because even a fried egg is, is a plastic according to the directive. The only exemption being viscose. And, uh, and that is why 
we are being asked uh, almost every day, can we use your product instead of plastic? No, you cannot, because our product is a thermoplastic material. It looks like, performs like plastics. It is a modified um, bio-based polymer, a man-made uh, polymer. And that's why, that's why it is under the uh, SUP directive. Now, because of all this, uh, our strategy is not to replace plastics. We are not on the defense mode. We are attacking. And we see that the, the world will not be able to live without plastics. We just need to redesign how we produce them. We need to redesign how we use them. And we need to redesign how we dispose of them. Ideally, we, we work with uh, reuse applications. But of course, uh, recycling is, is essential. Woodley is not a biodegradable or compostable material. It does degrade faster uh, than the conventional plastics, but it is uh, not degrading fast enough to fulfill EN13432 or ASTM6400. And that is why we do not allow anyone to claim it would be biodegradable. And we don't allow anyone to add biodegradation enhancers either to the material in order to avoid microplastics in nature. Now, we are a technology company. We have a, a large number of patents and a, a bigger number of uh, patent applications in place. Uh, we are uh, developing our technology further in terms of modifying the cellulose uh, with different additives to turn it into different um, grades of Woodley. Um, we have a team of eight people in the team, in the, uh, in the company, uh, roughly uh, one third focusing on sales and, and business development, one third focusing on R&D, and one third focusing on, on recycling and uh, sustainability. The first commercial application came to the market in 2020. And uh, we are still a small company. Uh, we raised three million in growth funding uh, last year. And uh, our business model is focused on selling the granulate uh, in order to demonstrate the capabilities of Woodley and also licensing our IPR. We don't have a factory of our own, so we are using third-party facilities to produce Woodley for us. And, and that also enables us to, to scale up production quite fast. Now with the uh, struggle on the logistics and, uh, and supply chains on, on the global market. We are saying that in, in, a, in a range of rough, roughly six to nine months, we can produce in the kiloton scale if necessary. Currently, we are producing, uh, let's say, somewhere in the range of 200, 300 tons a year. We have a massive ambition uh, globally. We are aiming, first of all, to produce 10 million tons of plastics uh, of woodly material by 2035. That would enable, via extensive recycling, uh, ideally five times per year, uh, replacing 15% of current fossil plastics, making us the second or third most abundant plastic in the world. Um, we are looking forward to becoming the most valuable material brand in the world. And by uh, uh, putting 10 million tons of Woodley onto the market and recycling it uh, either on our own or through partners, we would enable a reduction of 100 million tons of CO2 emissions from the plastics value chain. All this together would bring us in 2035 to having a revenue of 30 billion euros uh, in, in, in an EBITDA uh, plus 10%. Now, Woodley as a material is, uh, is carbon neutral. Our global warming potential is actually slightly negative. And uh, as we move forward, we improve our uh, bio-based content further. We can uh, improve the carbon, uh, uh, carbon content as well. We are 40 to 60% bio-based uh, at the moment with some fossil components required to modify the cellulose. Uh, Woodley 
does not contain any conventional plastic. So we don't compound uh, polypropylene or polyethylene or PET, etc., into Woodley. It is food contact approved. We have the EFSA approvals for our film grades and one of our injection molding grades. It's safe to use. There's no bisphenols, no phthalates, no carcinogens, mutagens, reprotoxics. All the components are actually such that they can be found in, in the nature, but they're just not yet being uh, available on uh, industrial, industrial scale so that we could use them for the production. Um, the recyclability, I'll come further further on to that as well, and the biodegradability I, I mentioned as well. The main raw material of Woodley is uh, from FSC certified forests. It's cellulose, which we modify. We have the two Austria certificate for the bio-based content. And uh, as mentioned, we are aiming to improve that. We, we have a roadmap towards 100%, although we are also looking into using recycled content in Woodley if, if and when seem necessary. Um, we have the LCA made by Peuri, uh, nowadays AFRI, uh, confirming our, our carbon neutrality. We have done consumer studies uh, showing that there is an interest for this kind of sustainable materials on the market. And, uh, and at this stage, of course, we are small, we are producing material which is more expensive. But this premium is seen as a uh, value on the market and, and there is a willingness to pay for it. It's a dropping granulate. So all our converters are using exactly the same uh, film blowing machines, cast film, injection molding, thermoforming, uh, etc., 3D printing. So no capital investments have been necessary in, in the manufacturing uh, of Woodley or of the uh, converted products making it easy to scale up. The processing efficiency is equal to fossil-based fossil plastics, so it is fast to process, and, and also the processing temperatures are high in the range of, uh, let's say, 170 to 230, and, and with some adjustments needed on, on the machine. So the operators do need to learn how to run Woodley, but it's, uh, it's quite easy. Uh, in terms of end of life, we focus on, on recycling and, uh, and reuse, of course, as well. It's detectable with near-infrared on its own stream, but it does not harm if, let's say, 5% ends up in, in the polyolefin stream. Uh, it's also, it also has a density higher than one, so it can be uh, sorted by, by uh, flotation processes. And we have tested recycling both with uh, uh, several different recycling equipment, but, uh, but also the properties so that um, by five times regranulating Woodley, we have not seen any damage to the physical or mechanical properties. In fact, we have seen the impact strength even improve after these cycles. Here you can see our product ranges. Uh, Woodley 100 is, is where we are furthest on the market for film, manufacturing and for thermoforming uh, also works for uh, extrusion coating. However, we are fine tuning that further to produce um, better grades for, for extrusion coating onto paper and board. Um, injection molding, we have a couple of uh, commercial grades as well on the market. 3D printing, we have done some uh, demo electronics um, by 3D printing. We are working on on the automotive sector with pure woodly materials, but also on composites. And uh, we're also working on bottles for injection, uh, for injection blow molding and blow molding. And uh, we, we do still have a struggle there with the, with the barrier properties, but we are working on, on those as well to improve, improve them further. And also we've been able to produce uh, textile fiber out of woodly, but uh, that, is not yet the, uh, that is not yet commercial. Here you can see some product launches. So we have we've been working for or with HK Scan. This packaging was made by Vipak, a, a multi-layer packaging for grills, grilling sausages. We've launched uh, with Kesco, the, the Finnish retailer, a flower packaging made with Woodley, replacing OPP. Uh, another OPP replacement for salad and herbs with Vihreya Keijo, 
they actually managed to get get their product to to Lidl. Uh, they they won a competition with our packaging uh, organized by Lidl in Finland last year, and then a recent launch uh, with ST1 Helmi Simpukka uh, gas retail chain. Uh, they uh, have launched our our uh, kind of heat sealed packaging for fresh sandwiches where they have seen that the food, amount of food waste is uh, significantly reduced thanks to the packaging. And this is uh, really bringing a, an advantage to using our material versus a uh, too tight material. And we have a, an injection molding launch uh, coming, coming soon as well. Other product pilots, we've done uh, zippers for zipper bags with Lplast in Poland. These are available from, from Lplast. We've done uh, uh, textile packaging with Black, black Moda. Uh, here again, also the textile industry is very interested about the breathability because uh, in many cases, the textiles are produced in the equatorial area with high, high humidity. And then there is mold uh, growth in, in the textiles during transportation. And uh, there are hopes that our material would help, help with that. Um, this is a fishing rod packaging replacing PET thermoform from Woodley, not yet commercial. Uh, 3D printed electronics, injection molded boxes. We've been working with Ortex for quite a while, but these are not yet uh, commercial either. And uh, we've done pilot testing for holographic film production, and Woodley, Woodley film works very well in that application. When it comes to our value chain, how we work, there are the FSC, PFC certified forests. The cellulosic material is converted to make it thermoplastic. We add additives, we compound it to produce woodly. We then supply it to converters. We are working with converters in Europe and uh, exporting all the way to uh, uh, Far East Asia. Uh, as an example, we have uh, distributors and partners practically globally already operating with us. We work with uh, roughly 150 globally leading brand owners, um, promoting our products uh, towards the consumers as well, aiming for a, a very thorough uh, circular economy model with reuse, mechanical and physical recycling, chemical recycling, and, and finally, waste to energy if that is the only option. In, in waste to energy, the emissions from incineration of Woodley are 70% lower compared to the conventional plastics. So that is, uh, even though it doesn't make sense, there is a benefit uh, versus uh, fossil plastic incineration as well. Ideally, all plastics should be recycled and we are prepared to buy back and take back, back um, recycled or Woodley for recycling because we have a big demand from a number of brand owners for recycled Woodley already. All right, that was my presentation. Here you can see my email email address and, and uh, check out our website. And please do follow us also on, uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter and uh, Instagram. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tommy. Very interesting. Uh, I, and I'm impressed with your plans for 2035, I must say. <laughs> Quite big. <laughs> uh, you have to be a bit crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I hope you will succeed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at we least too. coming close to it. We have actually a lot of questions, but we don't have any time. That's the problem because we, we have the annual meeting coming up in just one minute. Uh, I, I see the questions. You now. see the questions, yes. Yeah. Can you can you take care of them and handle them for, uh, instead of me reading them for you yes. right now and, yeah. and answer the the, present, the 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 people who has put sure. the question because it's quite interesting I think and as you can see it's quite a lot of interest so yeah. I will I will be more than happy if you can do that because yeah. to save I'll, I'll go through them thank you um, very much Woodley uh, should not be mixed with other plastics but it can be mixed uh, in in recycling in in small quantities we've tested it both ways. Ideally, it should be uh, recycled on its own. Right. Um, we can. We have produced uh, cast film. Uh, we produced film ranging from thirty microns all the way to eight hundred and fifty microns. Uh, we've also done two millimeter thick sheets, aiming for ten millimeter thick sheets. Um, in injection molding, 
various ranges of thicknesses have been have been produced as well. Um, then there was some on the Q&A. That was maybe for you, Bo, if, if the presentations can be made on, on the homepage. It will, it will. Yeah. As, as, as long as you allow it, of course. We, 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 will, make the, we will make the presentations, uh, uh, we will put them on the, on the website as in a PDF format. Um, yeah. And, and also the, the, recording, the recording will be put there so everyone can listen to it again. In, but yeah. it will take a week or two before it's, it's published. There, there was a question on contamination on the PET stream, if the density is yes. over one. Uh, that is true. So the PET stream would contain woodly, it would contain other polymers with higher density as well, and paper, etc. So those would need to be, be sorted if that would, uh, that would be the case. We are still testing the compatibility, how it affects uh, the PET stream. Okay, Tommy, I think we have to, to stop here. And um, if, if there are other questions you want to answer, you can do that uh, personally, direct, direct to the people here. <laughs> so I would like to say thank you for, to every one of you. Today we were 300 registered participants. Uh, uh, and that's quite a good number, as, as always, when we do something. And I hope you have enjoyed. And we will be back in, a, in like a month, a month and a half with another webinar. As you know, every six weeks, we, we try to present some kind of uh, webinar about bioplastics, because it's very important to spread the message. So um, please stay safe. Let's hope for a better world in the near future. And uh, thank you very much for participating today. Bye-bye.